The Trifle Man A Little Tombstone Short Story By Celia Kinsey You are listening to an AI narration. If you'd rather read this short story, there is a link in the description to a free ebook containing this little tale. A note from Celia, this short story takes up where the previous novel, Tamales at High Noon, leaves off and is a prequel to Home on the Mange, the next full-length little tombstone novel. Part 1 It wasn't until my cousin Georgia resorted to reaching her bare hand into the enormous dish of trifle that our friend and neighbor Phyllis had prepared to be the centerpiece of Georgia's young son Maxwell's seventh birthday celebration that we all got a look at the foreign object Georgia had hit with her spoon. Georgia had been portioning out dollops of trifle into paper bowls for Maxwell to distribute to the guests scattered around the dining room of the Birdcage Café when she left off spooning out mounds of cake, whipped cream, and fruit to fish around in the dish. What is it? I asked. Isn't it obvious, Emma, she shot back. It's a pocket watch. Georgia has no patience for useless questions, and she was stating the obvious. Despite the whipped cream, raspberries, and bits of canned mandarins clinging to the case and the chain, it was clear that the object Georgia held up was an old-fashioned pocket watch. Heavens above, said Phyllis, how did that get in there? Little Maxwell had not been enthusiastic about Phyllis's gift of a birthday trifle, he'd have preferred a chocolate cake baked in the shape of a scimitar, but he's very fond of Phyllis, so he'd tamped down his distaste for desserts containing fruit and said, of course, he'd love to have trifle for his birthday. Maxwell had, however, gotten his way when it came to the theme of the party. The dining room of the Bird Cage Café had been transformed by Janie, a waitress and friend of the family, into a cardboard paradise for pirates. Janie must have needed a dozen refrigerator boxes to build the kid and pug-sized pirate ship that contained what amounted to a throne on the decks for the birthday boy and his menagerie. The birthday boy had been flitting to and fro dispensing dessert, and his menagerie, consisting of Earp the elderly pug and Hercules the pot-bellied piglet, had been taken out back to answer the call of nature by Oliver, Janie's boyfriend and our resident handyman at Little Tombstone. It was just after Georgia had unearthed the antique pocket watch from the depths of the birthday trifle that Oliver returned with Earp and Hercules in tow. I'm pretty sure the health department for the state of New Mexico does not sanction pugs and pigs on restaurant premises. I'm also quite sure that any health inspector worth his salt would have had something to say about Phyllis's husband Hank, who was sitting at his customary table in the corner of the Bird Cage Café dining room, smoking like a stevedore and periodically tipping ashes from the end of his glowing cigar into the overturned N.O. smoking sign he habitually used as an improvised ashtray. Do you think it would hurt to put the watch under running water? Georgia asked no one in particular. She was letting the watch swing back and forth from its chain like a Victorian hypnotist, trying to mesmerize his subject. Unfortunately for Georgia, the residents of Little Tombstone are not, as a group, susceptible to suggestion. We're an ornery, militantly independent lot. Living in a rundown roadside tourist attraction will do that to a person. After what that watch has been through, I don't think running it under a little water will do it any further damage, said Juanita. Juanita Gonzalez is the proprietress of the Bird Cage Café, has been for the past 40 years. Juanita took the watch back to the dish room, and I could just hear the high-powered dish sprayer over the sound of Maxwell remonstrating with Earp the Pug, because the animal had returned from the outdoors with his pirate costume askew. It was while Maxwell was attempting to realign Earp's little pirate hat and adjust the leather belt into which Janie had tucked a tiny scimitar made of flexible plastic that the boy noticed the small, yellowed envelope the pug clutched in his teeth. Normally, when it comes to Maxwell, Earp is the soul of patience, despite the humiliating get-ups the boy stuffs him into. This may be because Earp grew used to being dressed up daily back when his original owner, my great-aunt Geraldine, was still with us. Or it may be that Earp is genuinely attached to the kid, or it may be mostly due to the trail of tidbits Maxwell is constantly dropping accidentally on purpose for the pug to snaffle up. The kid is certainly attached to Earp. Maxwell regards the pug as his best friend in the whole wide world. However, this evening, contrary to the pug's usual willingness to put up with just about any outrage, Earp was not keen to give up his treasure. 
don't pull on it, Janie warned Maxwell. It'll just end up tearing. Earp will give it up on his own, soon enough, Oliver suggested. Part 2. But Earp didn't give up the letter, instead, he retreated inside one of the pug-sized holes Janie had cut in the side of the pirate ship, knocking his hat clean off in the process, and had just out of reach in the darkness, mouthing his prize. It's probably just a piece of old junk mail, Georgia suggested in an attempt to dissuade Maxwell from dismantling the hull of the cardboard ship and burrowing into the hulk after Earp. That envelope hadn't looked like junk mail to me. It had looked more like an old letter, but I wasn't about to gin up Maxwell's curiosity and cause him to destroy Janie's cardboard masterpiece in an attempt to prevent Earp from chewing the letter to bits. In the end, Maxwell was distracted by the return of the pocket watch to the dining room. Look at this. Juanita had emerged from the dish room, holding the antique pocket watch aloft. I think it's real gold. It looked like real gold to me, too. We all crowded around Juanita as she laid the pocket watch on an empty table and dabbed at it with a paper towel. Erp and his purloined letter were temporarily forgotten. Does it open? Oliver asked as he peered over Juanita's shoulder. Juanita tried to open the watch case by pressing down on the side, but nothing happened. Let me try with my pocket knife, Juanita's husband, Ricky, suggested. This method was more successful. Ricky popped open the case and handed it back to his wife, who examined the old picture nestled into the case opposite the timepiece itself. I think I recognize these people, Juanita said. Who is it? I asked. I think that's my great-grandparents. Juanita handed the watch to me, and I took a closer look at the tintype photograph, which showed a beautiful young woman wearing a mantilla and a severe-looking bearded gentleman dressed in a high collar and a long beard. My grandmother immigrated from Spain in 1920, Juanita said. She may have brought the watch over with her. So, you've never seen this before? I asked. Never, although I do remember my mother mentioning several times that she'd had a watch belonging to her grandfather, but she either misplaced it or it was stolen sometime after I moved out of the house. Do you think this is that watch? Janie asked. Juanita was so distracted by informing her husband where their teenaged grandson, Timo, had disappeared off to that she didn't even hear Janie's question. Apparently, Timo and Marco, the son of the barber-slash-lay preacher who lived and worked in the building next door, had taken their tacos to go and abandoned the rest of us to play video games in Marco's room until it was time to go home. Do you think this is your great-grandfather's watch? Janie repeated. I'll have to dig out the only picture I have and compare it to this, but I think it might be, said Juanita, after the whereabouts of Timo had been established to his grandfather's satisfaction. It was no use to suggest Juanita ask her mother to identify the watch. Mrs. Florenza Hernandez, known to me as Grandma Flo, lived in a memory care center in Santa Fe. Sometimes, Grandma Flo remembered the past with astonishing detail, sometimes, she remembered nothing at all. Why don't you take the watch home with you for safekeeping? Georgia suggested. If it really is your great-grandfather's watch, then it rightfully belongs to you. But how did it end up in the trifle? I asked. That was a mystery no one was willing to hazard a guess to. Phyllis, who'd run a pawn shop for years before retiring to marry Hank and take up residence at Little Tombstone, said that the watch was likely quite valuable. She examined it and looked for maker's marks, but found only a tiny monogram engraved into the watch case behind the hinged frame containing the photograph of the ancient couple. What's everyone looking at? Marcia Ledbetter asked as she came up to the table where the rest of us were still examining George's unexpected find. About half the guests at Maxwell's party had dispersed, for one reason or another, after the main course, but now Marcia was back. There was an antique pocket watch hidden in the trifle, I said. No one knows how it got there. I see, said Marcia, as if antique pocket watches in the trifle were par for the course at little boys' birthday parties and excused herself to visit what she euphemistically referred to as the powder room. Marcia was back, but Marcia's son Ledbetter and Morticia, both longtime residents of the trailer court out behind the bird cage, were still nowhere to be seen. 
Come to think of it, after initially taking an interest in the newly washed pocket watch, Maxwell had also slipped away somewhere. Where's Maxwell? I asked, and Hercules? Part 3 I assumed that Earp was still holed away inside the cardboard hull of the pirate ship, reducing the old envelope and its contents to shreds. Maxwell is out in the hall preparing the entertainment, Georgia told me. He took Earp and Hercules with him. Of course, there would be after-dinner entertainment featuring the birthday boy. Maxwell likes nothing more than performing for a crowd. What are we in for? I asked. I hope no one is going to be forced to walk the plank. Maxwell says it's a surprise musical performance featuring an ensemble cast, said Georgia. Marcia helped them rehearse, so I doubt it's anything too wild. Marcia Ledbetter, who'd recently moved to Little Tombstone to be near her son Marcus, who we always simply referred to as Ledbetter, had relieved Georgia of her duties homeschooling young Maxwell so Georgia could take a job with an engineering firm in Santa Fe. Mrs. Ledbetter is a retired teacher, former head of her homeowners association, and as proper as they come. There would be no untoward shenanigans on Mrs. Ledbetter's watch. Maxwell says there will be a very special guest artist, but he refuses to say who, Georgia informed me. Sanctioned by Marcia? Yes, she assures me that there is no need for concern. Mrs. Ledbetter is a great one for organizing. She could have organized the sinking of the Titanic and gotten everyone out alive, right down to the ship's cat and the rats from the hold. I was still examining the antique pocket watch and wondering how it had ended up in Maxwell's birthday trifle, when the boy of the hour flung open the back door to the dining room and yelled, there she blows, at the top of his lungs. It wasn't the yelling, Maxwell's fake peg leg, or even the plastic prosthetic hook he'd shoved over his left hand that had me nervous. It wasn't the fact that Hercules the pot-bellied pig, who Maxwell shoot ahead of him, could barely see because her little pirate hat was obscuring the view out of one eye, and her little hot pink satin eye patch was obscuring the other. It wasn't even because poor Erb, who still clutched the mostly intact letter in his teeth, now had an addition to his swashbuckling costume. The pug now wore little cavalier boots on all four feet, and every other step he stopped to shake each paw in succession, trying to dislodge the odious footwear affixed with Velcro around his ankles. While all this was unpleasant for the poor pug, what had me really worried was the mini-cannon Maxwell dragged behind him. While the mini-cannon was certainly more theme-appropriate for the current occasion than it had been for its original debut at Hank and Phyllis's wedding, where it had been used to shoot rose petals and jolly ranchers over the assembled company of well-wishers, I felt it was highly unsafe for such a contraption to be fired indoors. Georgia and I were apparently of one mind because Maxwell had barely gotten the words, there she blows, off his tongue when Georgia said in a loud, firm voice, please tell me that thing's not loaded. Maxwell, apparently reluctant to break character to address his mother's concerns, shot back, shiver me timbers it's not. It isn't, said Marcia. It's just a prop. Are you absolutely sure? Georgia said. Absolutely, said Marcia, I took the precaution of pouring plaster of Paris down the barrel. That thing will never fire again. Those unfamiliar with the residents of Little Tombstone might think Marcia's determination to make the mini cannon inoperable was overkill. I, for one, applauded her efforts. Hank, as fond as he is of the kid Maxwell, is not known for his good judgment and I could easily see him aiding and abetting any attempt to render the cannon operable for Maxwell and his menagerie's big entrance. That's a relief, said Georgia. Maxwell said there's a special musical guest. Who is it? I asked. I'm not at liberty to ruin the surprise, said Marcia. But I can reveal that one of the singers is the last person you'd expect. He's a very pleasant, light baritone. Marcia and Ledbetter had still not reappeared, and now Oliver and Janie were also missing, so I expected the entrance of a quartet, probably dressed as pirates. What I had not counted on was a quintet. Part 4 It was hard enough to recognize our four little tombstone residents in costume, and it was not until Maxwell had dramatically announced the entrance of the Hornswogglers, ho, 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 and a bottle of rum that I recognized the fifth member. 
As Marcia had intimated, the fifth member of the Hornswugglers was indeed the last person I would have expected to dress up like a pirate, rim his eyes in black, and sing sea shanties at a kid's birthday party. Pirate number five, who made, in my estimation, a very fine specimen of a privateer, was none other than the village of Amatista's only lawyer and most eligible bachelor, Jason Wendell. The Hornswugglers started out by singing the Wellerman, which I was later informed by Janie was currently the craze on TikTok, and then moved on to blow the man down. I had been in error when classifying the Hornswugglers as a quintet. They were, in fact, a sextet, Maxwell joined in. Alternately, if you counted the occasional grunt contributed by Hercules and the intermittent howling of Herb as being part of the musical fabric of the sea shanties, the Hornswugglers were an octet of singing ruffians. The Hornswugglers finished off their performance with a rousing rendition of Blood Red Roses. They got a standing ovation for their efforts and then dispersed to mingle with the other guests and have a belated bowl of Phyllis's delicious, if slightly contaminated, trifle. It was just as Jason Wendell sidled over to me, and I'd asked if he'd gotten his sea legs, that Maxwell yelled, got it, and held up the letter Erp must have finally given up mouthing and dropped on the floor. It's got Juanita's name on it, Maxwell said as he waved the letter above his head. Georgia, who is a stickler for etiquette when it comes to her son addressing his elders as Mr. and Mrs., might have had a bone to pick with Maxwell, except when we all crowded around to see the letter, it wasn't addressed to Mrs. Juanita Gonzalez. The front of the envelope was addressed to Juanita Hernandez, and it had been postmarked in Santa Fe in July of 1970. That is you, Juanita, isn't it? Georgia said. There's no return address, I pointed out. Open it. Open it. Maxwell yelled. I think we all wanted Juanita to open it, but who knew what was inside? Maybe Mrs. Gonzalez would rather open it in private, I suggested. Juanita started to put the letter into her purse, but her husband, Ricky, said, you were only 18 when that letter was sent to you. I can't imagine what could be inside that would be of a private nature. Juanita still hesitated, but finally withdrew the letter and opened it. By the time she had read to the end, she had turned quite pink. I remembered hearing that Juanita had married Ricky at 19, so at first, I assumed that the letter she folded and placed back in the envelope might have been a racy missive from her husband-to-be. What does it say? Ricky, asked. That was my first clue that the letter wasn't from him. It's just an anonymous letter, said Juanita. I would never have imagined that I'd ever had a secret admirer. Secret admirer? Ricky said. It's nothing really, Juanita insisted. Just some teenage crush. Let me see that, said Ricky, and took the letter out of Juanita's hand. I think Juanita would have liked to hold on to the letter, but she didn't. As Ricky read, his face grew stormy. Who wrote this, he asked. I couldn't say, Juanita said. It's not signed. It might have been anyone. It could not have been just anyone, Ricky protested. Whoever wrote that letter had to have known you extremely well. I was dying to know what the letter said, but I didn't want Maxwell's party to end with everyone standing around to witness a painful marital dispute over a forty-some-year-old anonymous love letter. I asked loudly and pointedly if anyone would care for another serving of trifle, and Janie chimed in that we might end the festivities with a rousing rendition of He's a Jolly Good Fellow before the party broke up. We all left the dining room with Juanita and Ricky still in a standoff. Would you like to go for a drive? Jason asked me as we stood out behind the Birdcage Cafe and watched the lights come on in Ledbetter's trailer, Georgia, and Maxwell's tiny cottage, and Morticia's old Winnebago. How about a walk? I said. The stars are so pretty. Jason agreed that the stars were pretty and suggested that I might like to get a sweater before we set out down the dirt road that went past Little Tombstone and on up the hill to the Flynn Ranch and the old cemetery that overlooked the village of Amatista. Why don't you come upstairs with me? I said, surprising myself at the offer. Jason had never seen my tiny apartment over the bird cage, and although I had never seen his palatial home on the southern outskirts of Santa Fe, I had a feeling he was going to be horrified at my living conditions. 
Unfortunately, there was nothing I could do to rescind the invitation without looking ridiculous. It's cozy, was all he had to say when I offered him a seat on the couch opposite a large stack of sloppily folded laundry while I went in search of a cardigan and my courage. Part 5 Jason and I had been accidentally on purpose meeting for lunch at the Birdcage Cafe several times a week for the last six months. We had not, however, moved either into what one could easily identify as a friendship or a romance. I liked Jason. I liked him a lot. I had what most people around us had long ago realized was a colossal and undignified crush. Unfortunately, I was far from sure how Jason felt about me. Ready? I asked. Did you really write this? Jason asked, holding up a copy of the screenplay I'd been going over and left out on the coffee table. In my former, pre-Little Tombstone life, I had been a screenwriter. According to the Screenwriters Guild of America, I still am one, although what with one thing and another, even I forget sometimes. That is my screenplay, I told him. My agent wants me to make a few changes, before she tries to shop it around. It's good, Jason said. You couldn't have read more than three pages. I read eight. I'm a lawyer, remember? I did remember. I couldn't forget it. Do you ever think about moving back to L.A.? Jason asked as we navigated the dark narrow stairs back to the ground floor of the rickety wooden structure which housed the bird cage. No. I said. That came out more emphatically than I'd meant to say it, but my certainty seemed to please Jason. Glad to hear it, he said. During our walk, we chatted about how Marsha Ledbetter was settling in at Little Tombstone and how the rebuild of the tiny tourist cottage she was set to inhabit was coming along. We turned around halfway up the road to the Flynn Ranch and paused on the way back to chat for a few minutes with Freddy Fernandez, the devout barber, who was sitting on the back step of his shop, taking in the night air. As Jason was saying goodbye to me at the back door of the bird cage, before driving off in his spotless white Range Rover, he asked, Would you like to go see a musical with me? A musical? The Santa Fe Players are putting on a performance of West Side Story next Saturday. Would you like to go? Had Jason gotten tickets with the intention of asking me to go with him, or had he intended to take someone else, and his plans had fallen through? That sounds fun, I said. Great, said Jason, I'll text you the details. I couldn't go to sleep that night, and when I finally did, I dreamed that a pirate was attempting to hypnotize me by swinging an antique pocket watch back and forth while a chorus of pot-bellied pigs wearing tutus and Tyaris sang Gregorian chants in the background. I awoke unrefreshed. When I went down to the bird cage for a late breakfast, I stuck my head into the kitchen. Juanita was chopping onions and crying. The crying part one attributed to the onions, but I didn't like the ferocity with which she was wielding her knife. How are you doing? I asked. Fine. I didn't believe her. Is Ricky still upset about that letter? I asked. Yes. I'm sure he'll see reason and stop worrying about some love letter from nearly fifty years ago. I hope so. You really have no idea who sent it? Juanita looked up at me, onion-induced tears streaming down her cheeks. She didn't say a word, but she didn't have to. Juanita knew who'd written that letter. Is it someone you still know? Juanita nodded. Does Ricky know that? No. What are you going to do? What can I do? Ricky will just have to get over it? This secret admirer doesn't still have feelings for you, does he? Of course not, said Juanita, without a trace of hesitation. It wouldn't really matter even if he did. Juanita wouldn't so much as flirt with another man, much less be unfaithful. Why didn't you ever get the letter in the first place? I asked. I imagine my mother didn't want me to. She liked Ricky and wanted me to marry him. I suppose my mother didn't want to take the chance that I might waver. I suppose, but why wouldn't she have destroyed the letter? My mother kept everything, said Juanita. She has so much stuff that it's scattered all over the place. There are boxes in my basement, my brothers have boxes, 
and there's a storage unit full of things my mother couldn't bear to part with when we sold her house after she moved into a home. Were any of her things stored here? I asked. I was always bugging my mother to get rid of things, so it's entirely possible she talked Betty or Geraldine into letting her stash things at Little Tombstone without me ever knowing. Geraldine is my great-aunt, Betty is my grandmother. They are both gone now, so simply asking them wasn't an option. I'll check with Oliver, I told Juanita. What with the pocket watch and the letter both showing up like that, there's probably a lot more of your mother's things floating around here. I can easily see a letter getting dropped somewhere and erp finding it, said Juanita, but how in the world did that pocket watch end up in the trifle? That was something I was wondering about, too. Well, I hope Ricky sees reason, I said. Surely, after all these years, he has no reason to be jealous. Ricky might not have any reason to be jealous, but based on the grim expression on Juanita's face, her husband was feeling insecure, nonetheless. I was dying to know who this former secret admirer of Juanita's was. I had a feeling that if I let the question percolate long enough, I might come up with the answer without her even telling me. The question of who had hidden that pocket watch in Maxwell's birthday trifle, however, was one I was not hopeful of answering easily. Part 6 My probably not a date to see West Side Story with Jason Wendell was three days away, so I decided to apply my excess mental energy to figuring out how that antique pocket watch had ended up in the trifle. I started with the most obvious source of weird happenings, Phyllis's husband, Hank. If anyone had been in a position to introduce a foreign object into Maxwell's birthday trifle, it had been Hank, although I couldn't imagine why he'd do such a thing. But when questioned, Hank swore he'd had nothing to do with the pocket watch. I never touched the thing, he insisted. That was probably true, although, truth be told, I was far more willing to take Phyllis at her word than I was Hank. The evening of Maxwell's party, when the rest of us had crowded around the table in the dining room of the bird cage to have a gander at the watch, Hank had remained in the corner puffing away at his contraband cigar. Aren't you even a tiny bit curious where that watch came from? I asked. No, said Hank. Why should I be? Ain't none of my business. That watch belongs to Juanita. It had been confirmed that the picture inside the pocket watch was of Juanita's great-grandparents. Two days after the party, Juanita had brought in a copy of the picture she had so anyone who cared to, me mostly, could compare the portrait with the picture inside the watch. There was no question who the rightful owner of the timepiece was, but that still didn't answer how it had been returned to Juanita via submersion in a bowl of cake, fruit, and whipped cream. I'm not questioning whether or not Juanita is the rightful owner, I told Hank. I'm just curious to know where it's been all these years. You'll never learn to stop sticking your oar in, will you? It wasn't the first time that Hank had taken issue with my tendency to put my nose in where it wasn't wanted. There had been instances when he'd had a valid gripe with my propensity to pry, but I refused to acknowledge this was one of those times. I don't see any harm in trying to find out, I said. What could it hurt after all these years? Plenty, said Hank. What about that old love letter? He had a point. I had no doubt that he and Phyllis had had a lengthy discussion about the possible identity of 18-year-old Juanita's secret admirer. Juanita's husband has absolutely no reason to be jealous, I said. We all know that, said Phyllis, who'd just joined us. But I don't think Ricky does. What do you think about the watch? I asked Phyllis. It had to have been dropped into the trifle while it was in the kitchen of the bird cage, she said. I brought the trifle down after the party had already started. Everyone else was in the dining room eating tacos, and I put the trifle in the walk-in refrigerator in the back of the kitchen to keep it cool until it was time for dessert. I made a mental note to ask Juanita and Janie if they'd witnessed any interlopers in the kitchen during the party, but first, I wanted a word with Oliver. Oliver was out back in the trailer court, working away on the tiny tourist cottage that had, until recently, been rendered uninhabitable due to the collapsed roof and the floor that had places where the boards had rotted away so badly that with every step you took, you were in danger of your foot going through to the earth below. 
Cottage 2, as we all referred to it, sat next to Georgia and Maxwell's only slightly larger but newly renovated bright blue cottage. Cottage 2 had been slated for tear down until Ledbetter's mother, Marcia, had decided to relocate to Little Tombstone, and we had to find a place to put her. Just the previous week, a crew of workmen had replaced the roof structure and installed a new corrugated metal roof. Now Oliver was inside, hammering away as he replaced the rotted sections of the floor, which was nearly all of it. Oliver left off hammering when he spotted me hovering in the doorway. Hello, Emma. I have a question for you. Oh? Have you discarded any old boxes of junk recently? We are always finding more junk stashed around Little Tombstone. Every nook and cranny of the place is packed to the gills with sixty years of things its former and present inhabitants couldn't bear to get rid of. Nothing I haven't shown you first, said Oliver. Generally, whenever Oliver finds anything he thinks ought to be discarded, he'll set it in the back hall of the bird cage for Juanita, Georgia, or I to go through just to be sure that we're not throwing out something valuable such as antique family heirloom watches. I saw a couple of boxes in the back hall last week, I said. Do you know whatever happened to those? Oliver pleaded ignorance. According to our system, which had until this point worked flawlessly, the items placed in the hall were no longer Oliver's responsibility. I remembered seeing those boxes, but I hadn't done so much as peek inside before they disappeared. Where were those boxes from? I asked. I found them in the attic of this place, said Oliver. They had to go somewhere, because the roofers were coming. I'm not blaming you, I said. I don't much care what happened to those boxes, it's just that I'm dying of curiosity to find out how that antique pocket watch ended up in the trifle. That old letter and that watch must have been in those boxes, said Oliver. They must have been. I have a theory about how that watch ended up in the trifle, Oliver told me. You do? I think someone found it in one of those boxes and either intended to steal it or was afraid they'd be accused of theft because they were about to be caught with it. That was a possibility. But those boxes were no longer in the back hall the evening of the party. True, said Oliver. But they could have been in the dumpster. Have the trash people come to take the dumpster? The dumpster that sits out behind the birdcage cafe gets hauled off and replaced with an empty one every two weeks. I don't think so, Oliver told me. I left a bemused Oliver standing there with his hammer in his hand. I was attempting, without success, to scale the side of the dumpster when Ledbetter came out of his trailer and asked what I was doing. While Ledbetter was trying to talk me out of embarking on a second career as a dumpster diver, Morticia came out and suggested that if I was going to be mucking around in dumpsters, perhaps I should consider changing out of my favorite shirt and put on the pair of coveralls and knee-high rubber boots I kept for particularly odious tasks. It was a sound suggestion, and I took it. Part 7 Ten minutes later, with the assistance of Ledbetter, I was waist-deep in restaurant refuse, digging for the discarded boxes of stored memorabilia that had somehow ended up in the dumpster. Ledbetter and Morticia peered over the side, watching as I unearthed the first box from under a large black bag of trash from the bird cage. Take it, I said and heaved it over the side. Twenty minutes later, I'd found all three. Georgia was at work, but by the time all three boxes were rode up in the sunshine next to the small metal table and chairs Morticia kept in front of her Winnebago, Maxwell and Marcia, who had been engaged in furthering Maxwell's education at the tiny kitchen table inside George's Blue Jay Hued Cottage, came out to observe. How did these get tossed without the watch being discovered? I asked no one in particular. There must have been some misunderstanding, said Morticia. That would be easy enough to find out. Only Georgia, Juanita, or I were supposed to be making decisions about throwing things out. One of us, and it certainly hadn't been me, must have stuffed those boxes in the dumpster. While Morticia started digging into the first box, Ledbetter took charge of the second, and Marcia and Maxwell opened up the third, I texted Georgia. Did you throw out any boxes left in the hall, behind the birdcage? I got a text right back. Georgia insisted she had done no more than take a cursory glance inside those boxes before they disappeared. 
I went inside to the bird cage and questioned Juanita. She was uncharacteristically cagey. I'm sure whoever threw away those boxes meant no harm, she said. But it wasn't you? It wasn't me. Juanita rarely lies, and never without good reason. Also, there was no way she'd have deliberately thrown out her great-grandfather's gold pocket watch. Do you have any idea who it might have been? I asked. Juanita didn't say anything. She just went on stirring a pot of pozole bubbling away in a huge pot on the back of the stove. You know, who threw those boxes away? I said. They had their reasons. I wanted to know what those reasons were, but I had a feeling that Juanita had no intention of telling me. This has something to do with that old letter Erp dragged in, doesn't it? I said. It suddenly struck me that there were probably a lot more of those old letters, and Juanita's marital harmony depended on no more of them being discovered. Someone who knew about those letters, long ago intercepted by Juanita's overbearing mother, had thrown the boxes away to prevent the past from coming back to haunt all parties concerned. Whoever had thrown away those boxes had nearly discarded a gold watch, as well, but I doubted that had been their intention. I rushed out the back door of the bird cage and yelled, stop, at the top of my lungs. Everyone stared at me like I'd lost my mind. Put everything back. I said. What? Morticia asked in disbelief. Why, said Ledbetter. This is fun, Maxwell protested. Go look for wood, I told Maxwell. We're going to build a bonfire and burn it all. Maxwell hesitated for a second or two, clearly torn over the fear of missing out on the discovery of some treasure hidden under the mound of old letters and clippings that comprised the top strata of the box he and Marcia were mining. Then the lure of creating a fire won out, and he darted over to the perimeter of Cottage 2, which was still littered with bits of rotten boards and framing members left behind after the demolition of the damaged roof structure. Ask Oliver if he can take a break and help us build a fire. I yelled after Maxwell. Why are we burning everything? Marcia asked. I have my reasons, I said, taking a page out of Juanita's book. No one made me explain. I think they all knew that if I was willing to put my curiosity aside, there must be something significant at stake. Oliver took a break from installing the subfloor in the cottage and helped us mound up a small pile of scrap wood a safe distance away from Morticia's Winnebago. When the fire was going, we all fed the papers and the boxes into the flames a few at a time, keeping our eyes out for anything else of value. When I came across another letter, nearly identical in appearance to the one Earp had dragged in the evening of Maxwell's birthday party, I quietly slipped it into my pocket. I shouldn't have done it, I know, but I couldn't resist. I told myself I wouldn't open it, and I didn't but after I retrieved the letter from my pocket when I retreated to the privacy of my apartment, I scanned the envelope for clues as to the sender's identity. I came up with nothing and hid the unopened letter under my mattress to prevent any chance it might inadvertently end up in the wrong hands. I let the question of the identity of the sender percolate for a while. I roped a reluctant erp into several walks up and down the long dusty road leading to the Flynn Ranch to aid in thought but the only conclusion I came to was that Juanita's long-ago secret admirer must be someone she still saw frequently, otherwise why should she be so determined to keep his identity a secret? Juanita is a hard-working woman who is totally devoted to her family. Her only significant social relationships outside of Little Tombstone are with the small and formal congregation, comprised largely of ladies of a certain age, that meets every Sunday in the back of Freddy Fernandez's barbershop next door that's when it hit me. Part 8. I knew who Juanita's secret admirer was, and I knew why she wasn't keen on her husband finding out the man's identity. I took her poem, gave him a bowl of kibble, gave Hercules a bowl of bran mash I warmed up in the microwave, and then took them both out back to answer the call of nature. After that, I shut them both into the pen in the corner of my kitchen, retrieved the letter I'd hidden under my mattress, and headed next door to Freddy's barber shop. Pastor Freddy, as Juanita referred to him, was finally back open for business after weeks of ongoing repairs to the hole in the front wall of his establishment, the result of a car losing control and crashing through it one Sunday while Freddy's flock gathered for a service in the back room. 
Fortunately, there had been no injuries, save the driver, who died at the scene. As I opened the front door of Freddy's barbershop, the little bell over the door tinkled to announce my arrival. There was no one sitting in Freddy's single old-fashioned barber's chair, and the barber himself was nowhere to be seen, so I sat down in one of the several straight chairs lined up against the wall and waited. Dad will be right down, said Freddy's 19-year-old son, Marco, after poking his head into the shop to see who had come in. Freddy and his son live over the barber shop. Marco had just returned from a stint in juvenile detention, the result of a colossal lapse in judgment on his part, which had very nearly killed the boy. I was glad to see that the kid looked happier than I'd ever seen him, although no more inclined to engage in small talk. However, what I had in mind wasn't small talk, so before Marco could escape, I said, I have a question for you. Marco paused in the doorway. I was afraid he might simply pretend not to have heard me and bolt back upstairs, but instead, he turned around and faced me, although he did not look me in the eye. I did not put too much significance to Marco's hesitancy to make eye contact. There had been a time when I'd first met the kid when I'd speculated that he might not meet the eye of his own reflection when he looked in the mirror. It's about Juanita's watch. I said. I thought you might have some idea about how it ended up in the trifle. What's trifle? Marco asked. It's a dessert made of cake, fruit, and lots of whipped cream, I said. Somehow, a valuable antique pocket watch ended up at the bottom of a bowl of the stuff during Little Maxwell's birthday party at the bird cage last week. I don't know anything about that, Marco insisted. I'm not trying to get anyone into any trouble, I said. The watch cleaned up just fine, and Juanita has her family heirloom back, so I'm not looking for someone to blame. I'm just curious. Did you take that watch out of those boxes when you were taking them out to the dumpster? I never touched that watch, said Marco, all I did was throw away the boxes, just like I was told. Who told you to throw the boxes away? I asked. Marco probably wouldn't have answered that question, at least not truthfully but he didn't even have a chance, because just then, his father came down the stairs. Hello, Emma, said Freddy Fernandez. I waited until I heard Marco's footsteps retreat up the stairway to the second floor, before I revealed the letter I'd been keeping in my pocket. I held up the envelope, postmarked August of 1970, and addressed to Miss Juanita Hernandez, before I said, I believe I may have something that belongs to you. Freddy's face immediately turned bright red. I handed him the letter, and he mumbled something unintelligible before stuffing it into his pocket. Your secret is safe with me, I said. Some of us lit a bonfire on the trailer court yesterday and burned the rest. Thank you, said Freddy. I never imagined that my teenage crush would cause so much trouble after all these years. I don't imagine anyone could have foreseen that. Juanita would never. I know. Neither would I. I know. Freddy stood there, impersonating an overripe tomato afflicted with mutism, while I tried to decide whether to ask one last question. In the end, my inquisitiveness got the best of me. Just out of curiosity, I said. Do you have any idea how Juanita's great-grandfather's watch ended up in Maxwell's birthday trifle? Freddy hesitated before he spoke. It was well-intentioned, he said. I'm sure it was. Timo put it there. Juanita's grandson, Timo. Yes. Why? How? When? The day before Maxwell's party, Juanita found a couple of letters from me at the top of one of those boxes and asked me about them. I told her there were probably lots more. So, all those years ago Juanita never got a single one of the letters you sent her? No. Her mother must have taken them all. But how did Timo get involved? We decided it would be safest to bury the boxes at the bottom of the dumpster behind the bird cage so no one would find them on top. That seemed more like a job for the boys. I'd recently been in that dumpster myself. I had no doubts why Juanita and Freddy had decided it was a job for teenagers. Ricky is a jealous man, Freddy said. He's always been that way, although I'm sure he has no reason. 
I was equally sure that Juanita's husband had no reason to doubt her loyalty, but as badly as Ricky had reacted to one anonymous love letter addressed to his wife, I could only imagine how he'd have reacted to a whole box full. So, you and Juanita asked Timo and Marco to dispose of the boxes of Grandma Flo's papers? Yes, the one letter Erp found must have fallen out of the box and gotten left on the ground by accident. What about the watch? The boys dug through the contents of the boxes before they threw them away. And found the watch? Timo figured that the watch belonged to his grandmother, and he planned to return it to her, but when he walked into the kitchen with it, he heard his grandfather coming. Timo knew why his grandmother wanted the boxes of papers to disappear, so Timo didn't want to have to explain to his grandfather where he'd found the watch. I suppose that's why Timo dropped it into the trifle. Why didn't Timo just leave the watch on the kitchen counter? I'm not sure even he knows that. I suppose Timo just panicked. I imagine he didn't want his grandfather to spot the watch on the counter and start asking him questions about it. Thinking back on it, I hadn't seen Timo and Marco after the first half hour of the party. I thought they'd been up in Marco's room over the barbershop next door playing video games. I had no idea they'd actually been out back behind the bird cage, checking Florenza Hernandez's old papers into the dumpster. Well, everything is back where it belongs, I said. I hope so, said Freddy. I hoped so, too. The quicker Ricky forgot all about their ever having been a rival for his affections right up to the moment he'd married Juanita, the better. Would you like a haircut? asked Freddy. I hadn't really thought about it, but I did have a possibly might be a date coming up, and my hair was overdue for some attention from a professional. Just a trim, I said. Nothing too drastic. Maybe half an inch off. I told Freddy that I wasn't up for anything too drastic, but I felt like I was teetering on the brink of a new and exciting phase of my life. My latest screenplay might sell. I might finally have a post-divorce love life. Things were looking up. On second thought, I told Freddy. Give me a bob to my chin line. That's a lot to take off at once, said Freddy. Are you sure? Absolutely sure, I said. You have to take chances in life. True, said Freddy. It's better to take big risks and fail than to live with the regret of never having taken the chance when you had it. I'll probably always wonder if Freddy was keeping his mind on my haircut as he snipped away or if he was contemplating those lost love letters and what might have been. The End <laughs>